So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Elise Jacoby Legier, and as Jesse mentioned, um, what I'm going to present today is related to a chapter of my dissertation, and it's part of the uh, Sirwan Regional Project, which is in one of the projects in uh, the Kurdish region of Iraq. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, integrating geophysics and drone based multi sensor uh, remote sensing, um, searching for off site land use features. So sort of the outline of my talk is that I want to talk about what land use features are, what they look like on satellite imagery, and why I think that they're significant, uh, why they are significant. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the various methods for detecting uh, those features using remote sensing, and then some of our results uh, from this year one regional project. So land use features are pretty easily visible on satellite imagery, especially in the Middle East, especially in uh, northern Syria. Some of the most famous ones are these so-called hollowways. They're these linear trackways um, which emanate out from uh, highly nucleated tell settlements, uh, and they are the result of probably um, flocks of animals coming in and out of the cities. And they're part of this larger uh, agro-pastoralist uh, economy. Uh, some other types of land use features include field boundaries. So you have field clearance walls. You have field boundaries related to um, irrigation, agriculture. And then you also have uh, land use features, which include irrigation canals uh, and water management features. For example, the ones just outside of the uh, ancient city of Uruk, you have uh, field systems emanating away from uh, uh, canals and levees, and you can still see those on um, 1960s corona imagery. So sort of the, the theme of uh, my dissertation research is uh, what are the relationships and mechanisms between agriculture, the environment, and the rise of complex societies, which is huge, huge uh, question, a uh, huge thing to, to be investigating, um, particularly um, the, the driving disciplinary question is uh, what are the drivers for the transition to fully urbanized settlement? And like I said, this is one of the big driving questions in archaeology, and uh, one person alone can't answer that. Um, but land use features are direct evidence of agriculture, and agriculture is intimately related to um, many of the theories related to the rise of complex societies, and therefore I'm, I'm trying to uh, investigate uh, land use features uh, in our region, in the Middle East. So we have these big questions, but then what are the objectives that I can actually accomplish? Uh, the first one is to investigate the, the range of land use practices in uh, transitional environmental zones, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in a minute, uh, and I want to do this in order to, de to determine the extent to which land use practices are defined by the environmental conditions in which they're found as opposed to being culturally or politically mediated, economically mediated. Um, and then that involves just defining the synchronic and diachronic variation of those land use features in our region. So there are two basic models of land use in the Middle East that are basically environmentally determined. Uh, the first one uh, is has to do with dry farming, where you have a particular settlement pattern. Um, let's see if I have, there we go. Um, so in northern Mesopotamia, you have this uh, these nearly equally dispersed settlements um, with an associated land use pattern which is here, which is those, as I mentioned before, those highly nucleated settlements with uh, differentially, uh, or different intensities of cultivation around the site, and then you have those linear hallways or trackways coming out from the sites, and these are particularly distinctive of dry farming in, in northern Mesopotamia. And then in southern Mesopotamia, you have irrigation, um, irrigation land use practices, and those are off, uh, often associated with uh, sites being located along the nexus of these, these canal breaks. Uh, and like I said, these are two really general models of land use, but uh, how these bear out in more transitional zones is 
is less clear. So our study region is located in one of these uh, transitional zones um, between uh, rain-fed and supposedly irrigated uh, areas for agriculture. Um, so here's our um, study region uh, outlined in the square. Um, along the arc of the Fertile Crescent, areas in green are uh, above 500 millimeters and they're generally well suited for reliable rain-fed agriculture. And then anything below 350 millimeters is generally thought to be unreliable for agriculture. Uh, like I said, our study region outlined here uh, with the dashed lines is uh, sort of straddles that boundary. And these rainfall isohyets are generated from the GPCC uh, normal, um, normal precipitation values by month. And so they're there are not very many rain gauge stations in, in Iraq, and so these are just generalized. And um, as part of different, different research, we're definitely finding out that these are not quite as accurate as they could be with more instrumental data on the ground. But in any case, they give a, a rough estimate of, of the north being generally rain fed and the south being more irrigated. And then I'd like to sort of invest, uh, not sort of, I would actually like to investigate uh, whether. Um, land use features that, that we would expect in rain-fed zones have those patterns and, and land use features in those irrigated zones have those patterns. Um, we do know from areas in south, uh, east, southwestern Iran that uh, there are regions where in subsequent periods where the, the precipitation regime has not changed where you have um, both types of um, land use features in subsequent periods. Um, and so in that case, it's very clear that the, the land use practices are um, socially and economically mediated and not the product of their environment. Um, it's a little bit of a straw man, um, but this region is particularly interest, interesting to try and investigate those issues. So from satellite remote sensing, which is the way that most people tend to um, map land use features, you can see from our region that there are, um, it's really easy to see these terrace field boundaries, these raised aqueducts, and then in the, uh, the corona satellite imagery, you can see uh, some of these canal features. What's been less investigated in our region, but is well known from other parts of archaeology and in other places, is using uh, multispectral imaging for um, uh, for resolving these land use features. So you have our classic studies from the 70s of using um, thermal infrared uh, color photography, as well as um, some more recent uh, examples of using multispectral sensors to, to get at the, the different vegetation health uh, because of the, uh, the underlying archaeology. In any case, uh, what we're trying to do in uh, our region is uh, leverage drone-mounted um, multispectral cameras to allow for a more efficient uh, landscape scale investigation, maintaining that higher resolution. And then I uh, also wanted to integrate uh, these uh, drone-based methods with the more traditional geophysics. Um, and one additional part of this is doing off-site and between-site geophysical um, investigation is not, is not new. Um, Ken Kabame has always encouraged all of us to try and do um, magnetometry as landscape archaeology, but few people in the Middle East have done this. Jason Herman is one of the few who's gone off-site, um, although that's becoming more and more common, but he was one of the first. Um, in any case, um, trying to, to, what we're trying to do here is integrate uh, magnetic survey, multispectral imaging, and thermal imaging to, to combine them all together um, to get an integrated view of, of um, of the landscape. So zooming back in on our sites, uh, one of the, the I'm just going to concentrate on the, the site where we've done uh, magnetometry um, and all the other, uh, we've done thermal and uh, multispectral uh, uh, on the offsite. So we have offsite data for 
um, mag magnetics, multispectral, thermal, and I'm just going to talk about uh, the results of each of those. Um, so for, for our multispectral data, um, as Jesse mentioned, using um, a drone deployed multispectral camera, um, it's really efficient. It only took us half an hour to collect this, our whole site and uh, a good chunk of the off-site. Um, but obviously it's very seasonally dependent. There are no plants in the field at the time, so it would be sort of silly to do a multispectral um, survey at this point in time. But we did it because uh, we were out there doing the geophysics, which does require that there's no vegetation in the field at the time. And so these are doing both methods and trying to integrate integrate them is very seasonally dependent. Um, but uh, we are very excited to go back in March, sometime in the spring, and try and get a, a better idea of what the multispectral looks like um, for the off-site off um, at, at the site that we're working at. So we also did collect some thermal data. Um, and again, as Jesse uh, mentioned, uh, doing uh, thermal in a Mediterranean environment when it hasn't rained in months and months and months uh, is not a good time to do thermal. So uh, thermal data in Iraq in August, September, when it's 120 degrees during the day and 100 degrees at night does not reveal, and there's no moisture in the soil, does not reveal any productive results. Um, but perhaps in the springtime, um, post or in the fall when it starts to rain, um, there might be um, some different uh, conditions in which this method might be productive. But for now, uh, there's not enough contrast between underlying features. Uh, it could be that there's poil, uh, poor soil conditions or that this method just can't see um, features in this, in this part of the world, which is all right because uh, we also did a, a magnetometry survey, um, and some of the goals of this magnetometry survey, so why would you go 300 meters off the site, Look, what are you looking for? We're tr we were trying to determine the extent of the occupation of the second millennium site uh, and resolve associated land, land use features. Um, so what we found instead uh, is that we basically have a continuous archaeological landscape. And this was very surprising for us because we've gone almost 300 meters off the main part of the tell, and there continues to be occupation and, um, and buildings and um, other sorts of archaeological features. Um, unfortunately, no uh, discernible land use features. But it really was very surprising to find that there was no um, end to the occupation or to the, the archaeological landscape um, this far away. So we also did a bunch of magnetometry survey at other sites in, in s both similar and different environmental zones. So in, in these more irrigated zones, we are finding that so the extent of our site um, is not really reflected in the uh, magnetometry data. In fact, it looks like either due to, pl to plowing or actual, um, actual continuation of, of the archaeology that there is no discernible boundary to our, our, um, our sites in, uh, in our irrigated zones. But in our rain-fed zones, we are finding that there is, so there's a road here, but it, the road falls the, right along the edge of the site. We are finding that the off-site is very quiet and that the, um, the extent of the archaeology is really limited to the, to the tell, uh, which is a really uh, interesting environmental trend that um, I would definitely be interested in going back and finding if it's repeated in more places. We only have a few data points. Um, but it is, it is a really uh, interesting thing that we, we weren't expecting to find. Um, basically uh, questioning the idea of what is a site in Mesopotamia. Um, so while uh, I wasn't able to find any land use features associated with any of the sites that I investigated, um, some people uh, working at Best and Sur, um, this is not my data, this is, this is their great magnetometry data, uh, just to the north of our study region right up here, um, where they're working at a Neolithic site um, and they were able to find lots of land associated land use features. Um, so perhaps, perhaps, 
perhaps um, routeways and um, canal features associated with their, with their Neolithic site. So they do exist, even though I did not find them um, in our study region. But it does give, it, give me hope that, that they are there. Um, we're just perhaps looking in the wrong place. Um, but. So basically, in summary, we set out to look for land use features that might be associated with sites of different with sites in different ecological zones, and uh, we integrate, aim to integrate drone deployed multispectral and thermal sensing. Um, the thermal sensing was, was not particularly protective, probably due to the time of the year, same with the multispectral, but we're really excited to go back and use the multispectral because it is, um, it is so efficient. Um, what took me several days to collect with uh, a magnetometer only took half an hour with, with a drone. And so um, going back in the springtime at the correct time of year would allow us to test out the, the hypothesis that I've mentioned um, very efficiently. Um, so we're, go we're gonna do that and hopefully I'll have um, more results to present about that next year. Um, and that's, that's it. Um, thanks to all of the people who we work with in Iraq and then my uh, dissertation committee.